Hello, everybody. If you are new to our webinar series, welcome and thank you for joining us. Criterion Edge runs multiple informative webinars throughout the year. For today's webinar, uh, we'll be discussing post-market literature surveillance, systematic literature review, and we'll have a case study presented at the end. Our first presenter today is Lori Mitchell, founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing services firm serving the medical device, pharmaceutical and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety and pharmacovigilance management and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory solutions to many biotech and medical device companies, both large and small, she is a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is a published author and holds a Master of Nursing from UCLA. Joining us is Quinita Fernandez from Medtronic. Quinita has a medical degree from Maharashtra State University of Health Sciences, India, and is a certified healthcare practitioner and patient safety professional. She has 18 years of experience in the healthcare industry and has been with Medtronic for eight years in different roles and capacities. Her expertise includes medical safety, regulatory writing, complaint handling, and clinical research, to name a few. In her current role as medical safety manager, she and her team focus on post-market literature surveillance as a proactive effort to identify patient safety events. And now, Lori, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce our session today. Great. Thank you, Olivia. And hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today on deploying best practice systematic literature review methodology to support ongoing post-market literature surveillance activities within your organization. I'm so pleased to have as a co-presenter, Quinita Fernandez, Medical Safety Manager for Patient Monitoring and Respiratory Interventions at Medtronic. Welcome, Quinita. We've divided the presentation into two parts. I will begin with an overview of the systematic literature review process and how this process can provide data to help companies make informed, data-driven decisions every day. Quinita will then present an excellent case study example to illustrate how her team within Medtronic leverages the systematic literature review process to support, support post-market surveillance activities. This webinar, webinar will present you with practical guidance on how to conduct a robust systematic literature review and insights into how the data from those review, that review process, can be used to support organizational processes and decision-making. Then through the lens of a case study, you will see how the systematic literature review process can be leveraged to support required post-market surveillance activities. Companies need data to meet global regulatory requirements, to inform organizational strategies and direction, and to guide critical decision-making. Those are just a few examples. But performing the systematic literature review process, or SLR, can present multiple challenges to teams. For example, is there access to the right expertise, such as a medical librarian to consult with, to design a sound search strategy? Are regulatory compliant SLR processes in place within your organization, like in your SOPs, that describe robust literature search screening and selection activities? And lastly, even with all of the above, executing the steps of a systematic literature review requires people. Even with the tools, the technology, the processes described that are in place, there is ultimately no way to remove trained human eyes and brains from the process. The screening, review, and selection take steps take time and people, both of which may be in short supply within a company. Bottom line is that maintaining consistency and increasing efficiency is difficult when there is a lack of available resources or the steps are ill-defined or manual processes are used that are slow and prone to error. error. In today's regulatory landscape, adopting a transparent, reproducible, best practice process for literature reviews is essential. 
we'll start with a description of the steps of a literature uh, review. An SLR is a clear and methodologically sound plan for the identification, retrieval, selection, appraisal, and weighting of published data. This definition is taken from the 2000 article by Moorer in which the author describes the PRISMA statement, which is a reporting structure for the results of the systematic literature review process. Systematic literature review methodology is certainly nothing new. It has long been the gold standard process for evidence-based research, especially in the academic and professional arenas. Those same rigorous principles are now being mandated by global regulatory authorities and have been adopted by pharmaceutical, medical device, and IVD manufacturers as best, process, as best practice. Consider conducting a systematic literature review when there is insufficient manufacturer available data to address an organizational need or a regulatory requirement. Here's some examples. To learn about off-label usage of your drug and device or device to support various regulatory requirements in the US and Europe, to prepare a clinical evaluation report or a, a performance evaluation report for the EU MDR or IVDR compliance, to develop white papers or other clinical marketing materials, to gain insight into unknown hazards, to assess the current therapeutic landscape of your drug or device, to inform recommendations to management for additional clinical or non-clinical analyses. These are just some ideas uh, of uh, ways that SLR, the SLR process is deployed within an organization. Now let's dive into the details on the methodology. Here are the steps. Here's a bird's eye view of the basic steps of every systematic literature review. Develop and define the research question or questions that are under investigation. This is also referred to as the scoping step. Then design the search strategy and conduct the search using all relevant literature databases. Screen all literature references returned, and I emphasize the word all in that sentence, all of them, from the search by applying predetermined inclusion exclusion screening criteria to define the selection process. Extract relevant data from those included full text articles that were included during the screening process. And finally, synthesize, organize, and analyze the extracted data into a report to answer your research question. And there we have the steps, scope, search, screen, extract, and report. <clears throat> the first step in the scoping process is to define the research question, which we just mentioned, which is critical to the planning and execution of all of the downstream processes in the literature review. To establish the relevant research questions, you should first identify what is the purpose of your search. Basically, what do you need to know? The research question or questions will flow from there. Next, determine where to search by identifying relevant databases, Embase, Medline, SciSearch, and others. I will linger here, and it's probably going to come up again that we, what we are talking about is not PubMed searches and we are not talking about internet searches. These are searches, this robust methodology requires access to and the, uh, to a platform that allows you to build robust search strategies and the, using, you know, Boolean search syntax and so forth of a very, of a very elevated nature, and then looking specifically at Embase, Medline, and then any others that you may, um, uh, any other databases you may see that are relevant. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Next, identify the types of data you may want to exclude from the search. That the exclusion is really what the screening and selection process is. You're, you're screening for exclusion, such as, unpublished literature, you're not going to consider unpublished literature. You Maybe you don't want to consider animal studies, web content, technical. Uh, maybe the article has no um, 
data relevant to the device or drug that you're looking for. It's, it's maybe it's about um, patient satisfaction or something like that, and that's not what you're looking for. So those are exclusion criteria, typical. All of these upfront decisions that you're making in the scoping section, in the scoping, scoping step, will allow the librarian to build these limits into the search protocol, thus reducing the labor intensive screening time of the search results. That's a very important concept. Let the search itself do some of the heavy lifting for you. In other words, and in other words, let the search protocol help to reduce those unwanted results. As you can see, a well-defined scoping process can provide the foundation for the entire literature search, screening, and review process. It is essential to ensure that the research questions are clear, that the literature search planning process is thorough, and the search strategy is well documented. So some takeaways here. Take the time to develop those clear research questions and document your process for transparency and reproducibility. Consider developing a literature search scoping worksheet, which we deploy within our company with our clients to help guide and document your decision. Step two is design and run the search. So using the framework from the scoping exercise, the next step is to design and run the literature search. Here, you will need to identify key search parameters such as relevant search terms, for example, product names, PICO terms. And if you're not familiar with the PICO acronym, it stands for who is the patient or the population you're looking for? What are the indications or inter interventions? What and who are the comparators or comparison? And uh, the identified outcomes. Exclusion criteria for article selection, which we just talked about a little bit, such as the foreign language, the animal technical, might be examples of those you want to exclude from the search. And you'll need to establish certain search limits, such as the time range and the study level or the levels of evidence, study type or levels of evidence. For example, again, will you exclude abstracts, conference proceedings and so forth from the search result? So a couple of takeaways at this step are, use a librarian with experience designing medical information search strategies, and then maintain a record of all literature results, all literature results returned by the search. This documents that all potentially relevant articles were considered for inclusion when you move on to the screening step, which is next. This slide highlights some of the best practices for literature screening. One defining feature for systematic literature screening is the use of robust methods to minimize selection bias. This is critical. Successful screening depends heavily on clearly defined inclusion exclusion criteria, which are identified during that scoping step. Literature screening is a very human part of this overall process and screeners should be trained on and strictly follow those selection criteria. Think of it this way, the inclusion exclusion criteria defined during the scoping will now be translated into screening decisions. Let me give you a scenario. Perhaps you're looking for data to support a specific safety or performance outcome. For example, adverse event rates at 30 days on your drug or device. However, if the screener is reviewing an article that only reports AE rates at one year only, then that article could be considered for exclusion based on that criteria alone. In other words, it doesn't have the data in it that you are looking for. Maybe it has other information, that you would include, but it doesn't have that data because that's, that's very specific. And this example is only meant to reemphasize that decisions made at the scoping step flow through and have a direct impact on screening and selection process. So those initial decisions are very important to implement correctly during screening in order to minimize bias and identify all relevant data. Transparency and reproducibility are critical components of the screening process, as you can imagine. And you should definitely be tracking your screening decisions to comply with global regulatory standards. Lists of excluded references and the reason for exclusion for every excluded reference and the reason are common and expected reporting requirements. 
Lastly, and I'm sure it won't surprise anyone to imagine that Sirtis can return a large volume of literature, which then, those literature, which then must all be screened. One practical best practice strategy to manage this challenge and make it more efficient is using a multi-stage screening process, which is an acceptable methodology. Level one screening starts with the review of the title and abstract only. To identify those more straightforward screening decisions, such as is the article in a foreign language, is it technical, not related um, to the drug or device under evaluation, that first stage can save time by identifying the obvious excludes and the obvious includes based on title and abstract alone. And then what's left is a, maybe a whole lot of maybes. I can't tell from the uh, abstract and title. So I've got the obvious X includes, I've called out the obvious excludes, and then there's a whole lot of maybes. Those maybes, now you have to access the full text article to finish your screening decision. And that taking this approach can save you time and money and expends less manpower during the screening process. Data extraction is pretty straightforward. It should also be prospectively planned and consistent. Extract that PICO data that will serve to inform and elucidate the question for your review. Remember PICO is patient, intervention or indication, comparator and outcome. Another critical element of data extraction is a clear identification of relevant safety and performance outcome data, especially if you're preparing uh, a report, a CER or a PER or other reports required under EU MDR or EU IVDR requirements. The use of predefined, easy to use data extraction templates is advised as best practice as it helps avoid that human error, which often arises out of manual processes. Using data collection forms can ultimately result in cleaner data and greater efficiency. So if you want more information about best practice methodologies and validated tools to use for data appraisal and weighting, I've included some, I've included some references here on this slide for your information. Finally, the last step in the SLR process. Let's touch on the importance of thorough and transparent documentation of your literature review process. We talked earlier about the PRISMA reporting structure, which is a clear systematic flow diagram, which you see here, that documents each step of the review process. This is a typical PRISMA flow chart documenting the results of each step of the literature search, screen, and review process. Documentation requirements may vary depending on the end use of the data identified and extracted as part of your SLR process, but it will often include some or all of the bullets, documentation bullets that you see here on the slide. The search strategy and output, that transparent description of your methods for data inclusion and extraction, weighting and appraisal, and summaries of include, uh, included articles, all are common documentation requirements. It all depends on the end use of the data. And a PRISMA flowchart is typically included as part of the documentation required by regulatory authorities and major journals. Take, a takeaway here is this, as a rule of thumb, your documentation should be sufficiently detailed to support full reproducibility. So the importance of thorough documentation and transparent reporting cannot be overstated. That's it for me. Thank you for your attention. I ran through this pretty quickly. I hope the information presented has been useful. Useful. I'll now turn the presentation over to Quinita. Quinita? Thank you, Laurie. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, let me begin with first wishing you all a very happy new year. Uh, wish you health, happiness, and prosperity in this uh, 2022. Now, I'm very glad, um, Olivia, if you want to still keep to the first slide, thank you. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to present my team's best practices around systematic literature review. I'm thankful to the team of Criterion Edge for providing this platform and this amazing audience. 
I'm part of medical surgical medical safety team of Medtronic. One of the core responsibilities of my team is post-market literature surveillance, a process we took over in 2016, especially since our team has the relevant clinical bedside experience. Today, I shall attempt to walk you through the challenges we faced and the opportunities we tapped into, how we went about simplifying a complex process, defining and executing a proactive effort, and finally, the wins that followed. Also, I'd like you to note that during my talk, I tend to use few acronyms like SLR for systematic literature review and PMLS for post-market literature surveillance. So let's begin with challenges and opportunities. The idea here was not to reinvent the wheel, but truly take a deep plunge and understand what is not working and why not. Literature reviews were conducted by different teams for different reasons at different times, even overlapping timelines. Perhaps this is no news to you, and you may have found yourself to be in similar situations. It was soon evident to us that there was duplicative work, there was lack of clarity around adverse events, there were inconsistencies, teams were feeling overworked, anxious, and frustrated at times. Use of different resources, libraries, or tools for literature searches led to increase in cost, time, and headcount. There was also the added compliance risk of underreporting and investigations of safety events from literature reviews. At times, there were even duplications of complaint reports either created or reported to the regulatory authorities. But amongst all of this, what did not waver was our commitment to patient and product safety. We saw this as an opportunity to innovate and simplify the PMLS process. Medical safety envisioned that a standardized PMLS slash SLR process would not only remediate the issues I just said, but most importantly, here was our chance to create a proactive process that is compliant to both FDA and MDA requirements as well. So how do you simplify? Easier said than done, right? The conclusion was not far from what you all perhaps are thinking. That is streamlining and standardizing the overall process. But to begin with, we needed to get everyone on the same page and to do away with redundancy. As you may all be aware, such a process requires buy-in and approval from several stakeholders, complaint handling, marketing, sales, regulatory, to name a few. This was one of the complexities we decided to tackle first. We went to two key stakeholders. The first one was medical slash CER writers, who within their role work in parallel with other stakeholders, the ones I mentioned before. The other group was the clinical research team. Also to add, we had a team of librarians who supported us with their expert opinions to begin with, as well as continue to be a source of technical support to the team behind the scenes. Now, limiting the key stakeholders to just the most resource teams was the key to get timely, relevant information and to move with speed and decisiveness. And these groups needed to be influential enough to get everyone on one common platform and aligned to one common purpose. It is through identifying the right stakeholders that we were able to get rid of the noise and make speedy decisions. 
What this also did was reduce the time and effort spent by my team in gathering information, getting approvals, and mitigating delays. Most importantly, it led to a consistent flow of information that we could derive quality metrics and ensure accuracy of results across the board. The next big complexity we faced was the use of different resources or tools used for SLR. For instance, teams were using one tool to house articles, another resource to document reviews, another tool to investigate safety and performance, so on and so forth. We did an in-depth research of the available resources slash tools that Medtronic supported, as well as connected with external vendors who are considered best in class across medical slash pharma industry. We spend a good chunk of time to understand literature databases, public information housing alert systems, and explore the possibility of either using one resource or even perhaps syncing different literature databases wherever possible. This led to new partnerships and long-term collaboration. In addition, it enriched my team with new skills, new learnings, and helped break the silo. While we did this, we did not forget we need to be proactive as well. Once we figured out what is in our control and what we could work with, we were able to focus our time and energy on a common ground that we could cohabitate with our stakeholders. Firstly, we all zeroed down to one alert platform accessible to all within Medtronic Medical Surgical. By alert platform, I'm referring to the housing of product search terms, a platform that provides access to the necessary peer-reviewed journals that could be automated with some of the screening elements that are a must. They were touched by Laurie as in step one, and they could be synced with other literature databases. It also gave us the room to customize periodicity to be as proactive as you want to be. That is being alerted of publications daily or receive monthly notifications. Next, we came to an agreement on cohabitating in one library. A library that could provide visibility to reviews across teams. This would avoid duplicative work. A library that could be customizable, had automations to help reduce resource and time, was easy to learn and intuitive, and also had some of the steps that Lori talked, um, you know, talked about in step three and step four uh, in her presentation. At the end of the day, we could also get organized in this library, we could derive quality metrics, and align with good documentation practices as well. Actions speak louder than words. The third step was to define the core responsibility of medical safety specialists in the process, which was reviewing and investigating safety events, evaluating product safety by screening unidentified product risks, working with complaint handling and trending groups, product design engineers, risk file owners, and to take pro sorry, proactive measures ensuring safety of our product and that of our patients. We were able to capture and save our proactive article reviews in the library, and this could now be leveraged across various functions and teams. Data could now be leveraged to support post-market clinical follow-up plans slash reports wherever applicable, TSURs, audit supports, and other ad hoc requirements. Hard work does pay. The benefits of time saving, cost avoidance, resource saving, user satisfaction, and most importantly, minimizing compliance risk were seen not just in our team, but across teams. 
ठीक है Medtronic Medical Surgical Portfolio has products that are grouped within operating units, namely gastrointestinal, patient monitoring, respiratory intervention, renal care solutions, surgical innovations, and surgical robotics. Now, our SLR current SLR process has a global product coverage for all our brand products in all of these operating units. Being aware of potential risks on similar products in the market provides an opportunity to analyze our products against those risks that may have not been accounted for before. We are now able to review publications on our competitors as well as publicly shared information on their recalls and field safety notices. By including competitor landscape review, we support our design quality group risk management to not only determine previously unrecognized hazards, but also take proactive mitigating action. Our system runs over 350 automated search alerts once a month. Approximately 700 articles get reviewed each month. With the automations and system features we now have in place, we are able to reduce and maintain minimum headcount. Our partnerships also help us get quicker and accurate solutions whenever needed without having to run from pillar to post. The advantage of having a CPPS certified medical safety specialist from the start to the end of a SLR process were many. For instance, notified bodies want to see medical safety get involved at the time of defining the search terms slash criteria for a product. We now have the edge and could provide CER teams the audit safety net that they needed. We were able to screen articles for accurate complaint reporting, avoiding both underreporting and overreporting of complaints. Needless to say, this supported FDA and other regulatory authority requirements for investigating complaints from literature as a source. Performing proactive reviews led to immediate actions for instance, on off-label users or unidentified new, unidentified new product risks, helping us move with speed and agility. Finally, standardizing SLR process led to efficiencies that paid. Automation, collaborations with databases, training personnel with the required skills, medical safety specialists uh, having those product expertise, are just those few to name that led to cost avoidance, time and resource saving. Our approach that I presented today demonstrated the power of ideation as we explored scientific literature resources in unique ways, optimizing productivity and innovation. It exhibits the power of integrating technology as we blended databases to enhance efficiency and productivity, and along the way empowered our employees with new skill sets. And finally, illustrated the art of negotiation internally as well as externally, harnessing unused system functionality with no additional cost. In the center of it all, ensuring patient safety. This brings us to the end of our presentation today. I hope you found the information informative and have gained insights into the steps for conducting a methodologically sound SLR and how to adopt robust SLR processes within your organization, as well as ways to use published data to meet regulatory expectations and support internal processes. We'll now turn to our Q&A portion of our presentation today to answer any questions that you have. And I'll pull up uh, our first questions. Lori and Quinita, let me know when you can see it on your screen. Yes, I can see it. So I'll take this question, questions first. Um, I, as you know, I was reviewing some of the questions while Quinita was talking and, and some of your registration questions and it, it struck me that there were a, a lot of questions uh, around um, needing more clarity on what is the difference between systematic literature review for one process versus another process. And I hope that um, our, 
our comments today in the webinar have helped that, but you can see these, these are four questions that are along one theme, which is differences between the reviews for CER versus PMS. Should we have the same search for the PMS process as for the CER? And duplication of effort, again, I, all these things, and how do you integrate the results of CER and PMS literature search? So let me just start by saying that the PMS, every search is unique. Let me start at the highest level. Every search that you do is unique. It's unique for a job that you want it to do. Thus, those research questions in the scoping. So if you are searching for uh, PMS data, you have a certain set of criteria, exclusion criteria your, um, for screening. Your search strategy is different. Your time range may be different. All this flows from your uh, original first step of scoping, which is why do we need this? What is, what, what is it that we need to do? What questions do we need to answer? So that the main difference is, is that there's many differences between any kind of search and it all flows from the, diff the reason that you're doing the search. Is it best to have the same search for the PMS process as for the CER? Let no, it is not best to do that because of what I just what I just discussed. And let's be clear, a CER, and this is going to be, if there are any IVD colleagues on the call, this will be the same for the PER, Performance Evaluation Report. The CER, but I'll use just to truncate uh, my comments, I'll talk about the CER more. Um, a CER requires three searches, separate and individual searches to support the clinical evaluation review process. And that is the state of the art search, the competitor device search. These are not equivalents. These are competitors to the subject device under evaluation, competitor device search, and finally the subject device search. Three separate searches, three screened separately with different extraction rules and data review rules. So you can't, you can't cross those, you can't cross pollinate across searches. So I don't know how you avoid duplication of effort for the CER. This is why it is so, why it is so critical to, to plan for your CER processes because they take a while. Now, duplication of efforts regarding PMS. Can I just say that if you are doing PMS um, searches that ultimately will flow into P, a, a P, or even a PMCF searches, if you have developed PMCF activities, those will culminate into a report. You should, you should create after you get that search, you write up the results that will become a PMS report or a PMCF report. Those reports are feeder documents into your CER, not the search itself, but the results of the search and the write-up that exists in the report. And then the report serves as a source document to your CER. So that's a little bit about why, how you should, should you integrate the results of CER and PMS literature search. Absolutely, those are compatible um, uh, processes, but there's no real integration of the searches themselves. There's just an integration of the process. Uh, Quinita, do you have anything to add in there? Uh, no, Laurie, I think you said it all and said it, uh, you know, accurately. Yeah, you can avoid some of the duplicative uh, work, you know, in the steps that I aligned in my presentation by having consensus, 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 sorry, uh, from the stakeholders and see where you can house in that library and, and have everyone, you know, review your search terminology. But uh, exactly. that's where you can, you know, you can avoid those duplicated work, but, um, but well answered, Laurie. Right, right. I'll just finish by saying you just brought up a super important um, comment, Quinita, is that let's go back to our scoping. So as an organizational bird's eye view, way at the top, is your organization prepared to conduct these multiple literature searches from the point of view of what data are you searching for? So if you have subject device X 
and you perhaps done a clinical investigation on that subject device X, you had to identify as part of that clinical investigation in the protocol, the endpoints. Those endpoints, what data are you looking for in your clinical investigation? Those endpoints really serve as the data points that will live with that device throughout its lifespan. In other words, whenever you're doing a CER, the PMS data that you're assessing, the PMCF data that you want to collect proactively in the post-market setting, all of these activities do integrate together, as Quinita said, but she alluded to that you should have an overarching um, need and identification of the data that you're looking for over and over and over again throughout the lifespan of that device. So that's an important concept from in the clinical development plan of, your, of that device. You identify those data endpoints from the beginning and they populate all the way out through the lifespan of the, of the device. Great, thanks Lori. Mm -hmm. We have a ton of questions coming in. So let's get to our next question. For low risk devices, how would PMS literature surge activities be implemented since no data are explicitly reported in literature in most cases? So Quinita, I'll let you answer that, but this is often getting into the CER world. This is getting into those low risk legacy devices, all different, whatever you want to call them in which there is no one writes about guide wires. No one writes about um, catheter, a certain kind of a catheter that's, that's a part of a procedure. So you have to look more at surrogate endpoints such as procedural success in which your guide wire or catheter was used, things like that. But uh, Quinita, do you have any comments about how you tackle PMS literature searching for low risk devices? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think what you said is accurate, you know, uh, to make a note of certainly an important um, aspect. Uh, but just going from what I presented today, you know, within our process, we perform literature searches on all our devices. You know, there's no exception. This includes low-risk devices as well, or legacy devices, like you said. So no exception there. Um, it is exactly because of that there is paucity of publications this makes it more important to catch these proactively as they get published, right? So, you know, having that SLR in place, having that proactive monthly run alert, um, as you wish, really helps that. Um, in addition, we do have our clinical teams uh, who with input from other key cross-functional partners would decide what's the best strategy, you know, what's the best PMCF strategy, for instance. Um, and, and, and it depends on device to device, or case by case basis. And these strategies could include studies, registries, surveys, expert opinion, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, I want to go into the weeds with this one, but yeah, you know, to the overall point, do not continue having a proactive uh, process in place and, and frequency of that really uh, will help you catch um, literature as it's published. And then, as Laurie mentioned, the other uh, uh, the other elements will help as well. Right. Remember, the PMS data is essentially safety data. Um, at the end of the day, it's not as much about performance as it is with safety. And um, so again, keep in mind, and this is a global comment, not just for PMS searches, but whenever you're tackling a CER for low risk devices or legacy devices or well-established technology, any of those things, you have to get, when you're designing your um, safety and performance endpoint objectives, you might need to get a little, uh, the safety objective could be just basically reporting a certain AE, you know, at 30 or 60 days or peri-procedural or whatever it might be. And then the performance can be more surrogate, which, so kind of do a little research on what that means, which it means that, is it implied that the uh, guide wire uh, performed uh, well and as intended in a, in cases in which no AEs were reported. So that implies that the guide wire then procedural success implies guide wire success, performance success. So that's what I mean by a surrogate um, endpoint. So next question. Right. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori, for that. 
Let's get to our next question here, which is a somewhat of a two part question. Let me I, know we can't you can... see it, Olivia. I still see the low risk device. Oh, let me reshare here. Can you see there it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So I can, I'll take this, how to filter large numbers of hits and determine whether a publication is relevant. So let me zone in on the first question, which is how to filter large numbers of hits. Let's start with that. Once the search is run, if we're talking about MDR compliance, once a search is run and you've documented that search strategy and you've run and, and it's 250 hits, MDR requires that those 200, all 250 go through uh, screening. Um, so you don't, there's no filtering at that point. You can't filter them. One by one, you must go through them and bucket them as, you know, not, not included and or included. So be careful about this filtering thing. That's why I kind of emphasize when I was talking, that let your search strategy, your robust search strategy, do that culling for you as much as possible. But once, the, once you've got those 250 hits from that search, human eyes have to look at them. And so that's, and determine the publication's relevance. So I wanted to be real clear about that. How to document search hits that are not relevant based on the article title or abstract. Okay, we touched on that a little bit. And so again, if you're looking at the, if you have excluded animal studies, let's just say, and you go to the title and abstract and clearly, but that, that mentions your device and clearly it's in animals and, or it's a, clearly a technical article. It is not clinical in, nation, in nature with humans. That is an easy exclude and your exclusion criteria selected would be um, animal study or animal or technical study. You would, that's a, one of your exclusion criteria and you exclude it at level one because it's easy to spot. Uh, so that's how you would document it. Every exclusion for MDR, and this will be the same for IVDR, every excluded article of that fictional 250 search that I just talked about, every single one that's excluded, you must prepare a table with the, and the table is simple. It just has one column is the, is the citation reference. And the next column next to it is reason for exclusion. And those reasons for exclusion, maybe there's about five different domains that you would exclude an article for. They're also published in the CER. All of that's published in the CER. Okay, next question. All right, here's our next question. How do you approach post-market literature surveillance for a new device? Well, that's all you, Queen. Sure. So, um, you know, just like I stated previously, there are no exceptions in our SLR process. Um, so yes, new devices do get added to our list. That being said, of course, there is a core team that will support and kick off the initial literature process and, and of the newly launched device. When developing a, a CEP or a clinical evaluation plan, the team will include us met safety. We work together. We identify the key search terms based on our competitor or equivalent devices, indications, intended use, and other relevant search terms. And then there is a set time where there's a handshake with the medical safety PMLS SLR process that I that I presented today. And then it becomes an ongoing review, proactive review thereon. What this does is brings in that consistency Laurie was talking about earlier in her presentation across key search terms. And then there is less risk, rather, rather less fear of missing certain elements. Right. Also so, to note that if literature reviews completed early in the device life cycle uh, may have less output specific to the brand, right? But they may have more output related to, sim uh, to similar or competitor devices until the brand device has been on the market for a while. So having that competitor landscape review, uh, uh, if you integrate that within your SLR process, that again gives you this edge. Yeah, that's about it for me, sorry. I only would like to add that, imagine uh, an or your organization 
developing a new device and you you are from from r and d all the way through clinical trials or the collection of clinical data into um, approval and uh, you know uh, into the post market arena imagine that across your organization even as early as that that pre clinical development you're beginning to in your clinical development plan you are beginning to identify what are the the key uh, safety and performance endpoints that you're going to want to um, investigate in your clinical studies and, and so forth, and gather that data to help in the submission for the new device submission. So those early identified safety and performance objectives or endpoints will then follow, like I was just saying, follow that um, device throughout its lifespan. And now you've got it in early clinical, preclinical, you know, um, approval processes all the way through um, into the post-market, pre-market into post-market. Great. Here's our next question. What is one key item on the literature review that is still challenged to most writers and how can we work on this to improve? Oh, I, I can take that, Quinita. What is one key item on the literature review that is still a challenge to most writers? So I'm going to assume for this in this um, arena that the writer is not necessarily the one doing the literature review process. They are taking the output from the literature review and they need to now translate that into a report. And let's use our CER uh, model that we keep talking about. So data input in downstream into the writer of the report um, that came out of the SLR process. That's, that's my frame up. That's how I'm gonna frame that question. So I would say that a, the, the most difficult thing for a writer that is taking incoming data from an internal process and how they then deploy that and analyze that in the report that they're writing is that the data input is um, not well documented, that it's not clear. Um, having it in an Excel format is extremely helpful to a writer because they can sort for it. And this is the data extraction. So again, it's back to that setting up your search well and understanding what it is you need to screen for, exclude, and then when included, what data points are you extracting from included data? The, the length of the study, the N number uh, of patients exposed, uh, prospective uh, you know, or uh, retrospective study, case studies, um, AEs reported, it's a whole list of data extraction points that need to be um, um, extracted. And then if that's in a clear format, clearly delineated, and then in an Excel spreadsheet, and it goes over to the writers, then that's, that's great for the writer. So the challenge is upstream from the writer before it ever gets to the writer, make sure your processes are, and documentation are in good shape and the data goes to the, to the writer clean. All right, we have a few minutes left, uh, enough time to get through a few more questions. Our next one is how to report off-label use. Is all off-label use reported or off-label use with risks? I'll just, I'll let that be, Quinita, all I can say is in a CER that that's a question that we make sure we ask our clients is how do you want us to look for off-label data? Um, and that's a strategic approach approach in the clinical evaluation is, is off-label uh, uh, data even accepted in the CER and then how do you report it? So I would say for our point of view, again, downstream as the writers, are you going to be giving us off-label data so that we can strategize in the CER how to approach that? But for your uh, strategies, Quinita, what, what is your thought on off-label use in PMS surveillance? Yeah, so, you know, again, I think you said it well, you, you need to, there, there should be a strategy around this, and, and, and it's, it's kind of a tricky question, I want to say, but let me just answer uh, from med safety involvement, um, uh, if that helps you decide uh, within our process. So, firstly, 
within the SLR process where we get involved, we, we do not, again, restrict any reviews on our flavor use. So we have a standard SLR process, there's no limitations, no except, exceptions, all our flavor uses, whether it's high risk or low risk, there's no exceptions, we review them. Again, just to be clear, from publications, right, we're doing literature review, not from other sources. Now, since the process within our team is within med safety, off-label uses are reviewed and, and actions are actually taken and require, you know, wherever required, we initiate those actions. Um, this all gets documented and then that comes in, you know, we share it with our cross-functional team and they will follow their set protocols or like strategy, uh, strategize, like you said, Laurie, on how they want to report these safety events on, on off-label use. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's how med safety weighs in, um, uh, weighs in on off-label use. Often in my experience, what I've heard internal folks within the medical device companies, what they say is, we need to know how our device is being used out there in the world, no matter what. And right. so off-label use is, is, is definitely taken into consideration because um, we need to understand how the device, if once it's out there and the baby is born and it's out there in the world, we need to understand right. how, how that device is being utilized by the end users. So great question. All right, thank you, Lori and Quinita. I think that is a great place to end on. That's all the time that we have for today. If we didn't get to answer your questions or for more, in, more uh, questions on the content we discussed here, you can schedule a free appointment with us. Our contact information is consult at criterionedge.com. Thank you, Quinita and Lori, for your presentation today and everyone for joining us. Take care, and we hope to see you next time.